I came across someone talking about the 10 albums that greatly influenced their listening preferences. And I thought, what a great idea. These are 10 albums that greatly influenced my musical journey. And you're gonna wanna stick around because I pulled a good old Spinal Tap and I turned it up to 11. And that 11th one is one I've never talked about or shared here on my channel. Up first is the album that sparked my interest in modern music. Highly fuzzed out, dreamy guitars, it is Siamese Dream by the Smashing Pumpkins. 1993, super emotional, like heavy hitting rock. This would lead to me digging deeper into alt rock with Soundgarden, Nirvana, Stone Temple Pilots, Alice in Chains, all those other big, powerful players in the mid 90s. Before that, I didn't really have the passion around music that I would get and ultimately continue to have snowball over the years to what it is today, which is just absolute obsession. In at number two is The Bends by Radiohead. Released in 1995, I had already been a fan of the band thanks to Creep off of Pablo Honey. Other songs like Anyone Can Play Guitar, You, also really, really good. As someone who was taught by society at a young age that masculinity meant suppressing emotions and being tough, I felt strangely out of place. I sought out music as kind of this refuge. It kind of felt like it was the only safe place for me to truly feel and express emotion. This album played straight into that way more than this one could. Songs like the lyrically nonsensical fake plastic trees, the agonizing heartbreak of street spirit. These two songs really drew out that emotion and I would disappear into a world of my own. The band would go on to give us OK Computer two years later, which really just kind of expanded my ideas on what music could be and what it could include. That album cemented the band in my mind as one beyond defining themselves and thus one to watch. Then came 2000, they gave us Kid A, which absolutely floored me with the innovation and exploration that that album had. Back in the late 90s and early 2000s, it was exciting to see a band reinvent itself with each new album, and it further pushed me into this desire to really explore music. Pivotal album. Number three, Perfect From Now On by Built to Spill, 1997. Traditional song structures, but incredible hooks. Really the first more indie rock album I remember picking up brand new. I credit Siamese Dream with sparking my interest in exploring new music and Radiohead with allowing me more space to explore my emotions. I credit Perfect From Now On with igniting my passion for exploring the more non-mainstream side of music. Seeking out stuff that you just really didn't hear on mainstream radio, even the alt-rock stations of the mid-90s. I'll talk more about digging further into Pacific Northwest indie bands of the late 90s and early 2000s in a moment, but it all traces back to this pivotal album for me. And to this day, Perfect From Now On remains a pretty constant fixture in my turntable heavy rotation section and is among my top played records of all time. Number four. Also from 1997, Portishead by Portishead. This explored a darker space, emotionally, musically, conceptually. It introduced me to the use of samples and solid beats. A moment ago I talked about Radiohead and I don't think I really would have been as blown away by Kid A had I not devoured the first two albums by Portishead. The samples, the beats drew me into darker music in general. Like Kid A, I trace my exploration of other subgenres, post-rock, post-punk, all to my original love for Portishead. From the post-rock end, you've got bands like Explosions in the Sky, the Silver Mount Zion. Move on to goth and post-punk, we'd have me digging into bands like Joy Division and Bauhaus. See where I'm going there? All right, 
number five. Remember when I talked about Pacific Northwest? The photo album by Death Cab for Cutie is one of the earliest pieces of vinyl I purchased new. It further got me into vinyl, so I was really tempted to put that one on this list. But the more I thought about it, the more it didn't quite sit right with me. We have the facts and we're voting yes. It was one of the earlier indie albums I really became obsessed with outside of Built to Spill, though Perfect From Now On was actually on a major label at the time. This one really dove me deeper into Pacific Northwest indie rock and even artists beyond. The key is this, my introduction to Death Cab opened my eyes to the power of independent labels at the turn of the century. Indie bands weren't necessarily something new, like I said, but it was still in the beginning stages of my true exploration. I'd soon find a band like this that I liked, and then I would explore other artists on that band's label. The Shins, Long Winters, The Decemberists, Wolf Parade, and ultimately Fleet Foxes. A lot of Pacific Northwest in there. But it also led me down the path of exploring indie rock in general. And one of the earlier bands that I would discover as Napster hit its peak was through the exploration of Vagrant Records and the Anniversary's 2000 LP designing a nervous breakdown. That one isn't on this list. I just want to call it out because this ultimately led to that despite it being very different. They were kind of this poppy pseudo emo band from Lawrence, Kansas, and that drew me to other artists from Vagrant Records like Cursive, The Get Up Kids, Alkaline Trio, and yeah, Dashboard Confessional. But it expanded to exploring domino artists as well, like Sons and Daughters, The Kills, both of which focused on more dark rock sensibilities. Remember Portishead? Okay, let's move forward, but also back in time. Number six. Now, this comes with a little caveat. One of the most pivotal movies in my late teens was none other than Nick Hornby's High Fidelity, adapted to film and released in the year 2000. As a new vinyl convert, I remember going to watch it in a theater with a friend, seeing the opening notes of You're Gonna Miss Me by the 13th Floor Elevators, right here off of the psychedelic sounds of the 13th Floor Elevators. You know what I'm talking about, right? That four note riff, punchy, with an ocean of space between each single strum. Then you have the drums that come in paired with Tommy Hall's electric jug and Rocky Erickson's scream. That late teen just turned 20 or just about to turn 20, angst, wrought with relationship woes, and it all resonated so deep and sharp it cut my soul. I explored the band a little bit more, but even more so, it got me interested in exploring the roots of psychedelic rock and to a lesser extent, garage rock. Some of that would come a bit later, and that's not the only time you're gonna hear about that movie on this list. Let's move on to number seven, The Velvet Underground and Nico. 1967. Now, I cannot express how earth-shattering high fidelity was for me in the year 2000. Once again, here they are. I was a truly hopeless romantic teen when it came out, just about to enter my 20s that fall, and the pieces all fit. The heartbroken record store owner, Rob, the journey he goes on, all the great music within the soundtrack, even the point of being blind to his own DNA in the situation he put himself in. Something I wouldn't really realize or understand about myself for another decade or so. A lot of parallels. All of this to say that the second artist to come from the film is my introduction to The Velvet Underground. Of course, not this album. Who Loves the Sun, from that soundtrack, comes from Loaded. It took some time before that led me to The Velvet Underground and Nico, but there it was. And even more time before that album opened my mind to an entirely other world of music deeper into psychedelic, deeper into this experimental sounds that you hear here. You can't really talk about the Velvet Underground without discussing the influence that band had on music that came after. That's exactly what this had for me. Number eight, probably the most tragically underappreciated band on this list. I mean, what we've had so far is predominantly bands that a lot of people know. This next one 
is a bit more obscure though. Carissa's Weird and You Should Be at Home Here from 2001. I remember finding some little known college zine at the front desk of my college dorm in around the fall of 2000 or maybe the spring of 2001 sometime in that range, and I offhand picked up a copy. As I flipped through the pages, I saw a little blurb about a Seattle band, Carissa's Weird. As far as I can recall, it talked a little about the quiet, almost whispered, emotion-filled vocals, the melodic orchestration, and the captivating power of this band, despite all of the quietude. This all definitely intrigued me. So when I had a chance, I turned to the one place you went at the turn of the century to explore and discover music. Napster. My discovery of Carissa's Weird got me interested in more melodic, softer music. Originally, it was Ugly But Honest. That pulled me in with songs like Heather Rhodes, Drunk With The Only Saints You Know. But the album that I really put above all others by this band is You Should Be At Home Here. Ultimately, this led to a greater obsession with bands like Bell and Sebastian. The band split in 2003, but its members went on to several other projects, all of which I kind of devoured. Ben Bridwell started Band of Horses, and Matt Brooke played guitar on the first album, though never really committed to being in the band, and ultimately stepped away to work on his own projects, which was this next one. Brooke formed Grand Archives. Jen Champion, at the time known as Jen Ghetto, created a project called S. Drummer Sarah Cahoon released a few albums under her own name, kind of this folky, alt-country Americana thing going on there. And then, step before Sarah Cahoon, and you had Robin Perringer playing drums. Perringer would tour with Modest Mouse before joining the band 764 Hero. More melodic slow core like Low was also one that this ultimately led to. And then that brings me to number nine. Get ready for a collective groan because as far as this band is concerned, this album by them is probably the least favorite by the majority of people who like the band's early work, which personally, it's their best work, the early stuff. Mid-era, not so much. Modern era, better. Doesn't quite touch the uh, early stuff, but still better. Fold Your Hands, Child, You Walk Like a Peasant by Bell and Sebastian, also from the year 2000. My origination story with Bell and Sebastian obviously comes from High Fidelity. The song Seymour Stein from The Boy with the Ear Abstract was featured there when Jack Black walks into the record store and asks what tacky crap that they're listening to. Well, Bell and Sebastian, they responded. And he calls it Sad Bastard Music, a label that I actually kind of uh, enjoyed. I picked this one because it was an earlier obsession from the band, even though today it's further down on my list in terms of my favorite Bell and Sebastian releases. If I were to rank my favorites, it would probably be below the midpoint. However, it's what really got me interested in exploring indie pop. This led to an exploration of twee pop and chamber pop as well. Everything from digging into the twee explosion from Sarah Records during the mid-1980s to eventually exploring the earlier origins of orchestral pop music with artists like The Left Bank and some of the more pop-centric Nuggets comps. Early on, though, it led to the discovery of Acid House Kings and launched my true deep exploration and appreciation of Swedish indie pop, predominantly from the label Labrador. And then of course there was the Norwegian folk pop duo, whom I've talked about here before, Kings of Convenience, and member Erlandoy's project The Whitest Boy Alive. Let's move on to number 10. One of my all-time favorite bands, Blonde Redhead, Melody of Certain Damaged Lemons, year 2000. Once more, elements of melody of certain damaged lemons drew me to Blonde Redhead sometime, I would say, in the early 2000s. It wasn't the year 2000, but that's probably when I first listened to them. The art rock experimentation intrigued me, and the album as a whole was diverse and captivating. You've got tracks like the simple piano outtake, the very now famous thanks to Rick and Morty for the damaged coda. The wild, erratic one that came right before it, Mother. 
But it was earlier tracks, like in particular, and the dynamic duo of hated because of great qualities and loved despite great faults that initially hooked me on the band. The recurring theme in many of the items on this list is that these artists expanded my worldview insofar as music is concerned. They opened my eyes to new styles of music, new emotional depths, new inner worlds, and new planes of existence. Blonde Redhead certainly fit all of these. Because of both Melody of Certain Damaged Lemons and their 2007 masterpiece, 23, Blonde Redhead would ultimately become one of my all-time favorite bands. And like a few others on this list, they are one that has reinvented themselves a few times over the decades. Without 23, I don't know if I would have dug so deeply into the shoegaze and dream pop subgenres. In particular, not the song, but a statement. Exploring the origins of shoegaze, though some of that wouldn't really come until many years later. They did it again in 2023 with their release Sit Down for Dinner. My number 11, that sneaker that I just had to slip in there. I can't believe I've never talked about this band. And we talked a lot about early stuff in my exploration all the way through, you know, kind of the mid aughts. Well, towards the end of the 2000s and the early 2010s, I would really go on a much deeper explorative dive into the origins of garage rock. And one band from the earlier days that stood out to me was The Seeds and their debut album, The Seeds, from Crescendo. This album is from, I believe, around 1966. You had Sky Saxon fronting the band. All of their songs pretty much are a rendition of Pushing Too Hard, which is one that he wrote. And even there's questions there as to whether that song and that riff and that melody is truly Sky Saxon's original. There's some debate on that. If you are familiar, let me know your thoughts down below. Kind of a curious one there, though nothing has ever really came of the back and forth from it. This album really got me into exploring, one, early Pacific Northwest garage rock, Two, the earlier side of punk, garage punk, because there's a lot of parallels between this band and these bands, like the Sonics and uh, the Seeds, but the Standells, uh, and all of that that ultimately led into the origins of punk rock with the Stooges and even Velvet Underground. And you lead into bands like Television and, and kind of like this kind of punk, then leaning into post-punk. These are the 10 plus one, so 11 bands that really influenced the journey that I was going through over the last 40 now years. With a precise focus on about 15 years from about 1993 until about 2008, 2009. I'm sure this has been done and explored in the past, but I'm, I'm curious to see what other people would pick for their 10 albums. My top 10 albums of 2023 features Blonde Redhead and their 2023 album, Sit Down for Dinner. Well, where does that come in? Well, check out this video right here and you'll find out. As one YouTube commenter mentioned a while back, this dude's a damn nerd. I'm Andy, this is the Fence Post Final Channel, and I'll see you in the next video.